Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Today, I am joined by the magnificent Wayne Farrell, audiobook narrator. Thank you so much for joining me here, Wayne. Stop it, you. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, thank you. Good, good, so good. it's it's quite late. Uh, well, it's getting late there for you. Yeah, so. it is. It's 9 p.m. here in Thailand, so... Oh my goodness. Well, thank you so much. Oh no, thank you for getting up early to talk to me. It's wonderful. And everyone else as well. Absolutely. So um, before we, we get into introductions, I just want to do a huge shout out to Jackie or Jacqueline Hagen for introducing us and uh, helping this uh, connection happen to make the interview happen. So thank you, Jacqueline, if you're watching. And uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself, Wayne? Okay. Uh, well, my name is Wayne Farrell, as you know. Um, I am uh, an audiobook narrator. I live in Phuket in Thailand. Uh, I've been narrating books for, for many years at this stage, um, probably almost almost 20 or 25 years. Um, wow. And, that, and that's pretty much all I've been doing. So as I said, not, not the most impressive of lives, but um, it keeps <laughs> me going. I, I'd say that's quite impressive. <laughs> I uh, I know when I looked up your uh, catalog on Audible, at the very least, um, you have 102 titles mm. under your name as a, as a narrator. That's quite impressive. It's not bad. It's getting there. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's there's obviously there's there's milestones as you go through. I mean, you know, you want to get your first five and ten books and. And then you you know you you think you're achieving something then when you get to a hundred and then you you go and you look at someone like say Simon Vance or Scott Brick and they're up into right. a thousand books, um, you know, but over a much longer period of time obviously, but um, still a long ways to go and and a lot of learning to be done as well. Absolutely, I imagine. Uh, I I feel like no matter what you do, there's learning to be done. Indeed, for sure. Do you have a, a long term goal out of curiosity for how many you'd like to do? Oh, no, I don't think so. I think I would like to be um, retirement has never really appealed to me. Um, OK, I mean, I'm heading into my 50s now. Well, I shouldn't say that I'm I am 50. Uh, so I'm into my 50s now. But um, it would be nice to be able to, um, you know, to, to keep narrating into my 60s, 70s, 80s and all the way through um, and probably to to look at how um, how my genres would change as I as I go over the next say twenty or thirty years. Um, hopefully, if I'm alive, um, to continue narrating because I won't be able to do, you know, kind of young adult stuff anymore. So it's gonna it's gonna move right. much more into, kind of I suppose, I suppose at any age I think you can pretty much stay in the fantasy realm. Uh, so hopefully, um, if AI doesn't take over and get rid of us all in thirty <laughs> years from now, um, I'll, I'll still be narrating fantasy into my seventies. I'd say and, and thrillers particularly. Oh, Anything interesting. Serious. Yeah, no, that that's amazing. I, I always, um, I mean, I, I hope AI doesn't take over because I think uh, human performers are just so amazing at what they we do. Are. And, uh, but definitely it, it would be so such a, a nice way to continue your life. Oh, no, no retirement, yes. but continuant. <laughs> Put her on in my little box here. And uh, yeah. <laughs> And we have a few people joining us here. We have Jacqueline Hagen herself. Yeah, Good hey, morning. Jackie, how are you? Good. Fantastic <laughs> and we have, to see everyone, uh, indeed. Yes, JC. I'm, I'm not in the chat, as I said, because I don't have the dexterity to uh, to type and, and talk at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> All That's all right. People can do that. Mm. <laughs> and we also have uh, Andrew's Wizardly Reads here. Yes, Andrew, it is early for Hi, us, Andrew. late for Wayne. <laughs> it is late for me, but it's okay. Kayla, narrate books. Yes. Okay. Yes. She wants you to narrate. Yeah, you've got a great voice. Thank Wonderful you. Wonderful delivery. That'd be marvelous. Thank you should explore that for sure. Thank you. I've been I've been thinking on it. It's um, right. time. Time is finite. And uh, well, look at the studio box you're in. We were talking about that earlier. Yes, you were talking about that. Yes. It's, this is a uh, Studio Bricks One Plus booth. They're wonderful. Yes, but it, it's uh, it's an expensive uh, endeavor. They are, as well. Yes. yes. Sure. So let's go ahead and dive in uh, sure. because I have questions. We have questions from Twitter as well. So we've, we've got all the questions today. And I, I'd love to know where your passion for stories began. Oh, okay. Um, 
since I was a kid. I mean, literally since I was, you know, five, six years old. Um, it started with, I mean, every, everyone in my family is a reader. I mean, my, my mother and father, um, my dad's a technical reader. Um, Mum is more kind of fantasy and, and fiction. So they had me reading at a very early age. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always kind of liked I liked books, um, whether it was classic books, um, you know, like um, like Moby Dick, Sherlock Holmes, and kind of learning to read, being able to read those at, you know, say six years old, not really understanding them, mm -hmm. um, but getting but getting an idea of the stories, and then I think mostly um, I, I'd say cartoons as well, but but a very specific kind of cartoon. Um, do you know the Charlie Brown series, Peanuts? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. I grew up with so, those. Yeah. So that, again, that was that was me kind of, you know, in the in the, the mid 1970s, say to the late 1970s and watching those kind of stories, um, almost like ad adult type dialogue being done with with children um, and then wanting to know more about how that was made, because um, I don't know if you know, but originally the Charlie Brown series was supposed to be voiced by adults. Oh, and really? They started to do the pilot development phase of it. Um, they suddenly realized that, well, Charles Schultz realized that th this is not going to work for me. Um, mm. it, it doesn't have that magic that I want with kids. So they decided to take a step to, which was pretty much revolutionary at the time was to was to hire in kids as voice actors in the 70s, 60s and 70s um, and bring them on board. And the, the, obviously the studios knew this was a really big risk. Mm. Um, but it turned out the kids took to it like a duck to water once they were given the scripts and handheld through the production process. Um, and as I said, that that particular series always had an impact on me. And then um, as time went on and into the 70s, the BBC started to produce a certain kind of cartoon that's different from having characters in it talking to each other. So what you had was um, activities, animated activities going on on screen um, with a narrator telling you what's happening. So the narrator mm. being the only character and the only voice in this. And that's was a was a cartoon that I kind of preferred. Um, one was called Bod, um, B-O-D. It's quite okay. a famous cartoon um, on the BBC in the 1970s. The narrator for that was a man called John Le Miserier, um, who was a um, who was a British actor. Um, but what it what it does is um, rather than you being the casual observer watching something else, that type of storytelling kind of puts the narrator beside you, telling you what's mm. going on on the screen. So there's much more of a companionship element to that. And as, as someone who's highly introverted, um, it, it's really nice to kind of have that kind of a vibe going on. Mm. Um, and the BBC started to bring out all of these types of, of, um, of cartoons. Um, Mr. Ben was another one uh, narrated by a man called um, Roy Brooks. Okay. Um, and you also had the Mr. Man. I don't know if you've got the Mr. Man in the States. Uh, um, it's Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm in Canada here. So we usually get a oh, mix sorry. of My the BBC. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, we, we get a mix of the, the US and the Canadian okay, programs so you get both, or the yeah. British programs. Yeah. Mm. So the Mr. Men are, um, are a series of, of cartoon characters and each story um, was based on one of the Mr. Men. And it was normally to do with a character trait or an emotion. Um, that these characters okay. were designed on. So you had Mr. Happy, Mr. Sad, Mr. Bump, Mr. Topsy Turvy, oh, who was yes. very clumsy. I've seen um, those. Yeah, and they were narrated by another chap called Arthur Lowe. Um, and that again, that type of companion narrator through the series. Mm. Um, that I think that's where it all started for me, because the the Mr. Men had a had a series of books as well. Uh, so I used to read those to myself and then I used to read them out loud to my to my younger sisters and brothers. Um, and then I suddenly realized that like I was I was kind of good at reading. It was OK. Um, and yeah. they enjoyed the story. So I think that's where it started. Um, and then it just kind of carried on throughout the years then in, in, in various ways, shapes or form until I found myself uh, in the box. <laughs> it, I don't it know how that happened. I want to go check. <laughs> <laughs> it it started it it started with the books and reading to to family. That's beautiful. I yeah. I love that. that. That's the short answer. <laughs> yes, it ended with the box, but the <laughs> it ended with the box for sure. And now you have pe people listening from all over the world. <clears throat> yes, I do. It's wonderful. It's a privilege to to be able to do it. Um, uh, to, to be able to um to accompany people now the way those narrators in the yeah. past accompanied me. Mm. Yes, I I can only imagine. It's uh. 
it, it would be quite the journey to go from, like to start with and go through. And uh, did you, aside from the ones that you mentioned, because you mentioned programs and, and things like that, but um, <clears throat> I'm really curious if you had any favorite books that uh, you'd recommend to people watching. Oh, my goodness. Um, read Hard the choice. Classics. Read the, <laughs> All the classics. classics. Dickens, um, Arthur Conan Doyle, love mm. the Sherlock Holmes series. Same. Um, any kind of um, gas lamp fiction. Uh, okay. Sort of Vict Victorian type stuff, uh, M. Horror, Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft. I, mm. I love that whole um, candle lit kind of vibe that goes on, um, which is one of the reasons why um, I was instantly attracted to the Wickwire watch. Yes. <laughs> um, it's it's that, that whole wrought iron, um, as I said, gas lamp, wet streets, stonewall buildings, mm. top hats and, you know, big overcoats. It's anything <laughs> like that is, is going to be a favorite book of mine for sure. Oh, I love it. Yes, it is. Um, it's it's a beautiful vibe. It it's a beautiful a vibe to read. Um, I, it, it's unlike anything else, really. And she does it so well. She does. Yeah, you you almost want to put like a candle on and you know read read That's what the. Happens in the booth. <laughs> <laughs> there I you have. go. Read yeah. it the way the narrator reads it. <laughs> put a Indeed. candle on, folks, and uh, get your Riverfall Chronicles going. Um, so, uh, was audiobook narration? I know you talked about where you where it started for you and you ended up in the box, but was it always the option that you had planned to go with? No, it, well, it was something I would have, I've always considered doing. Mm. Um, but if you cast your mind back, um, mm -hmm. say, 10 or 15 years, um, the only way you were going to get work as an audiobook narrator was to be lucky enough to get hired by a publisher um, mm. and then end up in a studio. Um, and what really changed from that was, um, was when ACX came around, the, the audiobook mm. creation exchange. Um, and the, the internet allowed us to um, to both re record things um, at home um, and also to process them and, and send them up to, to various different platforms. I think if that if that had never arrived, I don't think I'd be um, narrating audiobooks at this point. I think I'd still be interested in doing it and I would still want to do it. Um, but it came up um, it came up just at random one day on YouTube. Um, somebody just kind of um, came up online some voice actor um, I can't even remember who it was at this point but they had mentioned ACX and I just kind of bimbled over and had a look I mean I didn't even own a microphone um, and I had a right. 10 year old laptop and all of a sudden I thought hold on a minute I could do that um, mm. but before I did that um, I don't know if you've ever heard of a website called LibriVox I think so. it sounds familiar LibriVox.org was the kind of precursor to ACX but you didn't get paid for it so you, um, it was like a voluntary organization that allowed you to to read audiobooks and then just put them up and there was there was lots of repeats um you know one narrator would um would record the you know the case of the Mazarin stone by Sherlock Holmes and you'd look in there and wow. 10 or 12 other people would have done it as well but you could you know you could choose your favorite narrator and go that way with it um so before I went to ACX somebody recommended I spend some time recording things on LibriVox to just get used to the whole Mm. idea of um because there is a big difference that you don't know until you start doing this work there's mm. a big difference between reading a book out loud uh, and then actually narrating it for a, <laughs> for a listener there's a huge difference um and if i listen to some of my early work 10 years ago it's just oh, you, know, it's, <laughs> you start it and you go like yeah i know every everyone's got that path that they've got to trudge down mm. um but uh yes it was um Going with LibriVox was a, was a really good learning experience. But um, as I said, the long and the short of it is, um, I, th I think it's always been in my mind that I would have been able to do it. And I was just very lucky that um, kind of all the planets kind of came into alignment with ACX and Audible uh, to be able to, to, to be where I am now, for sure. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, it, it's, it's, it sounds similar to what's happened with indie publishing where in the last few years indie publishing has boomed or self-publishing has boomed um, because it's it's becoming more and more um, recognized I imagine from readers as well and uh, or people just didn't know it was a thing it was the it was the similar path to you had to go through a traditional publisher and uh, so it's it, it's interesting to see that the two 
scopes, the two careers, uh, two fields have had a similar uh, transition. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jackie here, I just want to pull up her comment. I, I yeah, had no I idea. Yeah, I was just looking. <laughs> <laughs> and it's beautiful. Yeah. Um, she says, I had no idea we were such a perfect match in literary tastes. <laughs> And Joe followed it up with, I had no idea I wasn't. <laughs> uh, and we have Esme here as well. Welcome, okay. Esme. Hi, Esme. How are you? Hi, Daniel. And Daniel yeah. as well. Starting to see all these things coming up here. Yes. So um, in in going through this uh, exploratory um, journey with your audiobook narration, did you... Um, look out to do any vocal training any acting training um did you just practice and practice and practice how did that work out um i haven't done any uh, formal vocal training um every narrator will tell you i mean we, i get emails maybe once a week from people saying you know how do i become an audiobook narrator and every narrator will tell you the same thing is listen to as many audiobooks as you can particularly in the genres that you like um, a general rule of thumb is try not to narrate anything you wouldn't find on your own shelf at home um, initially uh, until you until you build up that experience. Um, but, um, you know, other than that, I um, many years ago, I worked as a production assistant and a lot of my storytelling skills come from I, I worked at a place called the National Theatre of Ireland, which is called the Abbey Theatre in Dublin um, as a lighting production assistant. But um, Back to back, I saw, you know, months worth, years worth of um, of plays. So mm. rehearsals um, from from rehearsing in a box space, first of all, um, to moving into the theatre itself and doing dress rehearsals and then operating a lighting board and watching the show night in, night out and suddenly realising that even though it's, it's, a, it's a one hour or two hour show you, you've seen every single night for six weeks, these people are so talented that it's like you're watching it for the first time. I don't think there was ever a, a time during any of the shows of the National where I sat there and went like, I'm bored now with watching this show. And some right. of them would go on for four to six weeks at a time, sometimes even eight weeks. Um, and backstage um, in the green room, um, whether it was on intervals or after the show or pre-show, um, I, I, I was lucky enough to be able to sit with some really famous Irish actors. Um, mm -hmm. And one person uh, in particular was a man called Eamon Kelly, uh, who's passed away now. He was quite mm -hmm. old at the time when I met him. Um, he was famous um, in Ireland for being called a Shanachy. And a Shanachy is a traditional Irish storyteller. Oh. He, was, he was world famous for this, but, but particularly famous in Ireland. Um, and I saw him in, in pubs um, and, and in theatres um, within Dublin with, you know, up to 200, 300 people in a room and being able to to get to a point where you could hear a pin drop and him sitting in the corner just telling a story. Oh, wow. Um, and I remember asking him over and over again, you know, what what's the secret to it? Um, and he had always said to me that the secret uh, wasn't telling stories, it was listening to them. So it's, mm. it's kind of very, very similar to that general narration advice of, um, you know, listen to as many audiobooks as you can. And I think that's the, the, was, it's probably the, the most training you can get in there. I have certain narrators I still listen to now. Um, Simon Vance, for one, um, who is my favorite narrator, literally in, in just how he can um, how he can lay out a story. Um, but most importantly, how he can lay it out without you really knowing that he's there. Yeah. Mm. So this thing of the, I'm sure you know from writing the that that suspension of disbelief, mm -hmm. finding that balance where you don't become jarring to the listener. I think that's really important, and that's something he has. I mean, he's got what almost a thousand audiobooks or something done at this stage. Yeah. And it's something he just does standing on his head, you know. And it's just um, <laughs> it's just absolutely marvelous. I mean, there's so many of them out there as well, but. But for me, he's the kind of the benchmark of, you know, where where most of us should be aiming to go. Right. And uh, you're not alone there. Esme agrees mm. with you saying oh, Simon Vance yes. is a favorite for her as well. And aside from Wayne, of course. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> well, he's, he's absolutely marvelous. I mean, he just, he just can't take it away from him. He's in a league of his own. 
Yes, yes. Well, and there are so many big names like that, like Michael Kramer as well is yeah. uh, quite a big one in the industry too. And mm. um, I, I, as as a reader, as a listener, I completely agree with the um, not taking the reader out of the experience. And it, it's tricky. It, I imagine it's tricky because if you come to a point where you've stopped recording for the day and you come in the next morning, your voice is going to be in a different state than it was it the is. night before because you're not warmed up the same way. Mm. Um, so I don't know if you have to do warm ups, if, if you do any of that to kind of help get in the mode. I have to do warm ups. Um, I have to eat. Um, a mm. lot of narrators will tell you about the dreaded um, stomach rumbles. Oh, no, they can come. They can come at any time. It just you never know uh, when they're going to come. So I, you've got to eat at the same time um, every day. So I'm up most mornings at about five o'clock in the morning. So I'll have breakfast fairly early and I'm in the booze for around about seven. Um, with uh, most of my stomach gurgles eliminated at that point. Yes. Um, some <laughs> vocal warm ups. Um, you'll find the longer you do the job, um, the, the more your, your voice tends to stay constant. So mm. if I if I'm narrating now, so for example, um, the Blue Flames is uh, it's 24 hours long. So there's there's a lot of vocal in that. And you'll find that after about the first kind of hour or two, um, your, your voice will start will start to stabilize. Um, right. And then you uh, it's kind of like getting into a mood or a vibe for something. So every day you come in, um, uh, it, it tends to just match up. Um, but initially, hmm. when you first start doing this, uh, your voice goes from high to low to un <laughs> until you're I, I think it's until it's kind of like muscle memory. It's like doing hmm. any job. It's it's kind of like when you, you're learning to drive a nail with a hammer into a piece of wood. You know, you're going to bang your fingers three or four times a day as an apprentice <laughs> carpenter. And then in the end, you're you know, you're looking in a different direction, hammering stuff in. And I think your your voice does the same thing, your your larynx and your neck muscles and your torso all develop this kind of muscle memory. I always find myself in the same position, you know, as soon as I get into the booth, even down to to shoulder angles or whether they're high or low. And, you know, as I said, interesting. So from, yeah, yeah, you, you do. And you become very self-aware. Um, and if anything's not where it should be, um, <laughs> you, I, I've got to stop and start again and just move the glass. Um, oh, wow. You, get, you can get distracted um, peripherally. Mm. Um, stuff is that's not supposed to be there. Um, right. So when I'm recording, <laughs> it's in the middle. Uh, so I just, you know, so my hand is, is I instantly found that. Um, yeah. So yeah, there you go. But that's it. Live discovery right there. Live mm, example. Exactly. <laughs> Hi, Tori. Hello, Sorry. Tori. No, that's all right. That's good. Thank you for joining us. Okay. So um, it kind of on that topic, you said mm -hmm. listening was the biggest thing for you that, uh, that well, or actually is it, was listening the biggest thing that you've learned in your career um, that's helped you? Or is there something else that you've learned that was huge? Oh, um, I think one of the things I learned over time was, I suppose a couple of things, you've got to, you've got to put the time in. So, mm. and this is, this is something that can, can happen. You've got to be very careful about when you when you decide that you're going to do this professionally so if, if if you're going to get paid to do something you're you owe it to the author to be able to produce to a level of quality that's very important mm. um and i think you've got to put the time in before so with somewhere like librivox as i said um it, it gives you a chance to practice stories um, you're not going to do that whole 10,000 hour thing because, you know, you're not going to start your career until you're in your 40s, um, <laughs> you know, if, if you're young. But um, I, th I think you've you've got to have a background in it. I think you've got to put the time mm. and the practice in at least um, until you're comfortable with yourself. Um, being not being afraid to be conversational about the read as well is something I learned very early on. As I said, if you listen to the first exposing myself here if you listen to my first couple of audio books um they're they're read incredibly clearly the diction is 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 a very mm. good quality and it's truncated almost to the to the point where it's robotic um mm. but, now, but most people will listen to it and say it was a really good book i mean that you know it's, it's it's all five star reviews but as a pro narrator kind of 10 15 years down the line looking back i you know 
the first thing I always go is like, I, sh I should have been far more conversational with it. Interesting. So to be able to read, you've got to be able to read the book as if you're talking directly to someone rather than reading it for yourself. Uh, and when you can get that in your head, um, it's a lot more fluid and a lot more conversational. I tend to, I can sometimes even put certain contractions into a text because it just flows better. And I know I could stop and go back and reread it again, but 99 times out of 100, I won't. I'll just keep that flow going. Mm -hmm. Again, we're back to that suspension of disbelief. Um, you know, d don't jar it out. Just just let it run the way it is. Um, and, I, you know, it's it's worked out okay for me so far. <laughs> I'd say so. I, I, I appreciate that advice because even for myself as someone who records videos, you can do so many takes. You can, you can do, uh, I don't know how many takes on one line because you didn't like how you said this or you could have said it better. But a certain, at a certain point, you have to say it is good as it is. I might, it might not be perfect to what I want, but it, it is good as it is. You yeah. don't have to keep trying to make it better. If you keep focusing on one line or one dialogue, you're never going to get past it. Mm. So For I definitely sure. appreciate that. Just go um, with it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, so we actually have questions from Twitter as well. And the first one cool. is from our very own Jacqueline Hagen. Uh, uh, she has two questions. So it's, it's kind of, a, well, yeah, I'm going to say it's two questions right. um, relative to each other. What kind of notes does he take to keep track of all the characters? And how does he distinguish them from each other? Okay. Um... I have to read the manuscript completely in the beginning. Okay. Um, and when I'm doing that, um, I, I use a, a an annotation software called iAnnotate, which is um, goes on my iPad. Um, and I color code each character um, to, to the limit of the iAnnotate software, which is about 15 <laughs> or 16 different colors. Um, so I, ha I have an idea of um, what the characters are doing. Do I have a picture of that? Jacqueline Hagen's... Um, can you see that? No. Uh, it's a bit bright, and I don't think we it's can... It's a bit uh... bright. No, it's not coming through. Yeah. Okay. Oh, That's wow. okay. What to do. Anyway, there you go. It's um, It's got colored lines in it, and um, that's basically how I separate characters. Um, and then what was the second part of the question? How do I... How do you distinguish them from each other? So the characters. Oh, by, by color coding them. By color coding. Yeah. So, mm. um, okay. All right. I'm going to, we're but... going to get into this a little bit more in depth later too, but I'll, okay. I'll save my follow-up question. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. Um, if, if we, that's, that's how I separate them in the manuscript. Um, but if you mean, okay. um, how do I differentiate the characters themselves? Um, I mm -hmm. work on the various different attributes of the voice. So I'm looking at um, I'm looking at their age. I'm looking at where they come from. Um, I'm trying to get a read from their their personality within the manuscript. Um, are they nervy? Are they jumpy? Are they confident? Um, are they sarcastic? Um, and also, do they move around a lot? Um, mm. If if someone speaks, if someone speaks in very slow kind of long languid words. They tend not to move themselves much, but very short staccato conversations tend to have a lot of hand signals involved as well. Um, I don't know if, if anyone knows this, but a lot of narrators use their hands when they narrate um, in mm -hmm. order to further emphasize. And you'll pick that up. There's tiny little artifacts in the microphone. Like, you know, the, the, the some of these microphones are incredibly sensitive. So they will feel that, they'll feel that air movement of of a hand gesture when you go, I told you not to do that, that because the sound is not just coming from a voice, it's coming from yes. your entire cavity, the whole thoracic cavity re reverberates when you talk. Um, so a lot of stuff like that allows me to differentiate characters that way. Um, and then I build up on on them by making notes about what they are. Um, there's a wonderful voice actor called Pat Fraley. Um, okay. And Pat has a um, he has a template that he uses um, to design character voices, looking at um, tone, pacing, 
um, mouth work, facial expressions, you know, yeah, um, how to twist your face to, you know, to, to get certain sounds out of things. And uh, yeah, but he's um, I, I've 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 learned a lot from him actually over over the years. He's brilliant. That's incredible. It um, it reminds me of a, a couple things I've seen, like my chat with Kevin Kemp. He talked about something similar, which is scrunching your face up or doing different yeah. motions with your face. And then in terms of voice acting, um, Billy West. I don't know if you've oh, Billy. Uh, seen. He's Sponge he's Bob. amazing. Um, <laughs> well, he also did um, like the Futurama voices. He yeah, did oh, like Ren and Stimpy, and and so. Uh, but he talked did about. He do SpongeBob? I don't think he did. No, I think that's running, a different. Like, mm, okay. But just like he talked about, like Sorry, even Billy. playing with his uh, his his own throat and vocal cords and oh, like yeah. pushing on them and and doing different things mm. to get different voices, and um, it, it's just incredible what you can do from external as well to to make those sounds. Yeah, everything. For yeah. Sure. Um. So you we've talked about this before. You've got 102 audiobooks under your belt here. I do. Um, in a variety of genres. Yes. So you've done superheroes with Wistful Ascending. You've got your gas lamp uh, Victorian as well. Um, what other uh, narration have you done for genres? Oh, I've done uh, historical romance. So oh, lovely. Pirate, yeah. pirate ships, m mostly around nautical historical romance uh, for Danelle Harmon, who is a uh, New York Times bestselling author. Oh, nice. A wonderful lady to work with. <laughs> um, spy and espionage thrillers, Catherine Guare, Deceptive Cadence, the Connor McBride um, series, um, Black December for Scott Hunter. I, I like the whole kind of thriller vibe. Um, thrillers, espionage, um, really like that. Fantasy, um, obviously I've got uh, the Riverfall Chronicles, all of the Morgan Rice books. Um, I've done, it must be 40 books or 30 books for Morgan Rice. Um, which is uh, mostly all fantasy as well. So I kind of cut my teeth on that. Um, when you're starting, you're kind of doing all sorts of genres because um, you, mm. you've got to take what comes um, in order to build up a portfolio. And then as, as time goes on, um, I don't think you, you get to choose your genres anymore as you get, as you get more experience. I think the genres just come and find you. Um, so more and more authors see more and more fantasy stuff coming through. Um, I enjoy reading fantasy. Um, I don't get nearly enough uh, espionage books, so uh, that's something I would really like to do in the future. One of my favorite books, um, talking about recommending books, is Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy by Jean Le Carre. Okay. Uh, he's an ex uh, MI5, MI6 officer. Uh, so wow. All of, his, all of his spy stuff is marvelous. Um, so, yeah, lots of stuff um, spy, spy thrillers, espionage, comedy. Um, comedy fantasy, um, the pilot series by uh, R.D. Drabble is absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's kind of sci-fi comedy with a fantasy edge on it. Oh, nice! Um, and uh, the the kind of latest kind of one I, I've done, which is uh, Wistful Ascending by the great Joseph Byrne. Uh, yes, yeah, he's over there in the corner. <laughs> Space you can, see that, you can see that cover from 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 a hundred miles away. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's one of my one of my favorite book covers. I have to say, it was marvelous when I when I saw it uh, on offer when they were looking for auditions for that book. I just thought, I have to have that. That's <laughs> I need to have under my belt. So it was marvelous. Oh, I love it. Yes, it's a beautiful cover and beautiful book on the inside. And Joe, if you do anything to get rid of those space bears, we've had this talk. You know where I stand. <laughs> <laughs> I love those space bears. <laughs> They're wonderful. They are. There you go. There's your live voice. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we have a, a question from Tori here as well. Do you have a favorite genre to perform? Uh, I, I love doing thrillers. Um, fantasy seems to be something that I do quite well, and I really, really enjoy it. Um, but as I get older, um, as I said, it's it kind of you kind of get restricted in the type of fantasy you can do. Mm. Um, I found over the past five years, my voice is starting to to go down in tone um, considerably. Um, if you listen to some of my early work, it's it's quite mid range and high pitched. Um, but but talking every day, doing hours and hours and hours of audio changes changes the um, the kind of I won't say the quality of your voice, but it, it changes the traits of it. 
and the, the characteristics in it. Um, so it's now, I'm now moving more into the realms of kind of a darker fantasy mystery thrillers. Mm. Um, but if it's fantasy or thrillers or espionage, it's, it, I, I'm, I'm in. You know? <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love mm. that you go with your voice as well. You're mm. not trying to fit yourself into a box. Oh you're yeah. you're a little bit more free with mm. it, and I think that's important. Um, thank you, Joe. The bears are safe. I appreciate that. <laughs> they are. They are darling. For now. For now. Oh. <laughs> uh, so Tori has another question as well. Do mm. you do anything differently to design non-human characters? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. non-human characters Let, let's go with uh, with the latest book I'm narrating is the Spectres um, oh. the Riverfall Chronicles yes. I have to be careful here I don't want to give too much away in relation to the story um, <laughs> you've got to um, you've got to dehumanize certain um, as you said not non-human characters or aliens um, but at the same time you can't go too overboard because they're part of the author's message. So in, for example, in the Riverfall Chronicles, the specters, um, the great thing about it is I, I don't have to make a generic sound for all specters because mm. each specter is, um, was a living person. So their own voices and characters in whatever decayed state they're in now um, will have an effect on, on how, I, how, I, um, how I do that voice. So they can be quite raspy um, or breathy um, mm. or nasal or it could come from the stomach, um, you know, or there could be virtually no damage at all. Uh, so I, I tend to focus more on the on the initial presence of the voice for, for non-human characters um, and slightly dehumanize it. So there's no there's no warmth in it. Um, mm. Remember, emotion. Uh, emotion runs the gamut across across humanity, across animals, across across everything that we have. Um, but if it's alien um, or non-human, if it's if it's a ghost or if it's if it's a demon or if it's some kind of horrible, um, I tend to just focus on 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 the message and then kind of build a vocal around that. Interesting. That no, mm -hmm. it absolutely does. Um, and and Joe has a follow up question here. How did you decide some of his aliens were Irish? How did I decide some of your aliens were Irish? I think I ran out of voices. Which one, <laughs> which one of his aliens? Which one of his aliens was Irish? Um, <laughs> Joe, you'll have to clarify for us. Yeah, you'll which have one? to clarify a little bit more about about which alien was Irish. Is an Irish alien? Who's that now? He's going to come back to me. He's going off to check. Is he? Or maybe uh, he's joking. No, there maybe. Must be, there must have been an Irish alien in there somewhere. Uh, well, we'll we'll find okay. out in a few minutes. There's a bit of a delay, so <laughs> let's put Wayne on the spot. Thanks a lot, Joe. Oh, two more oh. books to be read as well. Oh, let's see. It was it one was... of the random villains in one scene. Oh, okay. Um, so there you go. Um, that probably explains it. Um, <laughs> the fact that it's a villain is either is is either for me probably either either going to be kind of Cockney, rough, uh, you know rough voiced low level stuff it was great but now when i write that character species i hear them as irish that's a good thing maybe, <laughs> maybe they were irish originally i don't know how how many thousands or millions of years have gone by since they've evolved into uh, into those into those aliens <laughs> as such but um just remind me that they're irish random villains in Irish. there you go a random villains in isolated scenes are always irish of course as i said Think about a villain. He's either going to be very, very posh British, um, or very, very low level um, street Irish. <laughs> <laughs> a bit of a Which brawler. Which is me essentially. Yeah, it was just me. It's canon now. Good. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, do you do narration for other kinds of uh, projects? I do. Um, I do. In in brief, uh, I do a lot of documentary work. Okay. Um, I do e-learning uh, and a lot of medical narration as well. Um, oh, nice. So the ability to say kind of long words and chemical formulas and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I, get, I get quite a lot of work like that. Um, and I also do a lot of training videos for, um, I don't know, I don't know why, um, but I, I do them for the police, military, naval oh, wow. services, um, a, lo a lot of stuff like that. So it, 
one kind of you get this kind of knock-on effect where one person enjoys what you've done so they recommend it to somebody else or you know so various departments say within a military organization or within an airline or you know any kind of large corporate organization yeah. um, two 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 reasons for that one because they like the read and two because it takes a long time to find a voice um that's right for your for your company or your brand so when they've invested all that time in finding someone they don't want to go through another audition process again finding right. somebody else bringing them on board teaching them the company ethos so once you get in um it, it's actually quite simple to kind of network and, and go through like that um but yeah that's but mo mostly it's audiobooks okay no that that's brilliant though because that's two completely different scopes but very important yeah documentaries are a lot of fun um, yeah and, qu and quite similar to to audiobook narration but um you have to be kind of less conversational on documentaries than you would be in audiobooks yeah so you're kind of unlearning what you did with audiobooks right i imagine mm. um i missed a question here from derek he says not sure if this has been asked yet but how do you move through accents so effortlessly is it all a trick or editing with multiple takes or can you just shift from one to the other no i can shift from one to the other now oh that's brilliant mm. um but the color coding helps so I, I know what's come. I know which character is coming up. So, for example, um, on the Riverfall Chronicles, um, ink is highlighted in red. Reeve is yellow. Caradoc is a kind of a burgundy color. Chester is green. Uh, Delia is blue. So when I see all these characters coming up uh, in my peripheral vision, I know what's coming. Uh, so mm. on a breath, I can I can change from one to the next. Um, oh, wow. un unless it's very, very, unless there's lots and lots of people talking uh, at once right uh, then i may have to stop um or i just didn't i didn't like the transition that that's the other thing that you need to to be sure of um, right you don't want the reader to have any doubt about who is who is speaking now so yes if you felt that you didn't transition fully into that voice um it's time to to hit stop um and then do a retake again um and then i tend what i tend to do is it's it, it never works out sound wise to just stop on the stop on the character you were speaking about. So if I'm transitioning from ink to Delia and I feel the Delia trans transition didn't go so well, um, I won't stop and do Delia. I'll go back and do ink and then I'll transition through to the next character again so that that flow is seamless. Um, so there's certain tricks you pick up over time um, with experience, but um, the, the majority of times, uh, yeah, I just go back and forward between voices. That's incredible. Mm. Yeah, as someone who can only do one voice, it's yeah, incredible. It's, <laughs> with, with the exception of a spectre. Um, so if I've done okay. a spectre, uh, once I'm finished, uh, I need to take a break, drink 500 milliliters of water, and then go back in and, and then do it again because they're they're quite uh, they're quite vocally intensive. Yes, and I then, think then Jacqueline. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Jacqueline said here she needs to keep the yeah, lights on <laughs> for that scene. <laughs> That's nice. And uh, so we're we're going to keep trucking along here as well. Mm. And um, I so you've talked a little bit about your preparation that you read through the book sure. first. And I, I'm curious what other type of research you do in preparation to um, like with the author or anything like that to get ready to record. Some, some authors don't want to get involved in the production process at all. Um, some will come back to you um, and say, I really like the work you did on these books. Um, and so, so they, they don't want to get involved any further than the general questions I have for them. So I want a character breakdown. I want to know how old their characters are, um, where they come from, mm -hmm. um, if they have any verbal tics, um, are they anybody else? Um, you know, are, are they just are they, are they going to remain in the role that they're in now or at some point along the character arc, whether it's in book two, book three, book four, is there going to be some big reveal or some change or is there anything I want to look out for? Um, so, for example, you might have a character who's quite timid. Um, and over the course of the books, kind of gain, gains a newfound confidence and you you don't want to voice them in book one as you know mid or high range because by the time you get to book three you're going to run out of space to kind of right. you know, bring that authority into the voice if you like so anticipated
Oh, I think you froze there. Is that just me? Am I back? Hello. Oh, hello. Did I yes. Here. I think you froze. How far did I get? This is Thailand. Uh, it's probably <laughs> the internet has probably decided to to run away with itself. We've done very well so far. Actually, I'm quite surprised we managed to get 45 minutes without any kind of freezing going on. No, um, that's where, great. Where, when did you lose me? Um, about when you were um, talking about going into the authoritative uh, tone and yeah, having so, enough space for that. Hmm. So just after that. So I, I reckon, yeah, that, that's one of the important things for me. I want to know what the character timeline is. Are you going to develop that character further? Is there anything I should know um, about what's going to happen later on? Um, and then I sometimes will ask um, authors what they what they think their character should sound like in general terms. Um, sometimes I'll ask them to pick an actor um, that they think if, if, if they were to turn this book into a movie, for example, um, who would they want to play that character? Um, sometimes you can map the, the vocal out from there. Um, but most of the time, um, authors, as I said, are quite happy to hand it over to me, which is which is a pretty good thing because most audiobook narrators um, self-direct. We, we, we want to be able to to develop the, the book ourselves um, right. with with general guidance from the author about um, about how that should be. Um, one of the examples that I can give when I'm explaining that to authors is when you when you put your book out for sale and it's and it's bought by people, it doesn't come with an instruction manual of how to read it or how those right. voices should sound. Um, you may find that the characters in the book have one particular voice in your head and then the person next door to you is going to have something completely different again. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm being tasked with is to read the story make it as entertaining as possible but as i said at the beginning don't suspend disbelief for the reader mm. by making it too outlandish less is always going to be better um unless you really know your characters and then um, particularly in a series of books um a certain characteristic of, of characters within the book the traits within those characters are, then become an expectation so mm. for example with riverfall you're going to expect ink to react to certain things um, as time goes on. And that's something I need to keep in my head all the time is how did he react to this in the last book? So mm. when someone accused him of something, was it a general response of I didn't do it? Or or, or, or was that much more profound? Did he, did he come out? Was he much more aggressive with that? Was he very defensive? Um, right. And try and keep all those things in line as well. Um, and, the, and the way to do that, as I said, is to self-direct and keep your own notes in. Um, I have an author I'm just about to do a, a series of stories for called Alex Liszczak. Um, okay. And he came back to me and he said, I really liked what you did in Claude Makes a Friend, which is a book I did a long time ago. Um, and he said, if you could make my book sound like that, I'd be fine. So that's mm. all I need from him. Um, right. I'll do, you know, it's a very short book. It's about five hours long. Um, but I'll sit down over a couple of days and I'll go through that and develop characters and, and go that way. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, and that, that's a lot for you to keep track of as well. So that's a yes. lot of time. And, and, and I talk too much. I talk in. for the Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not <laughs> I said I'd keep my answer short and here we no, are. No, <laughs> this, this is brilliant. You know, it's, it's, it's a fascinating, um, it's fascinating to hear your experience with, with it, how you do things and to see behind the scenes, because really that's what you're sharing. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's fantastic. Don't worry about that. Right. Um, uh, so speaking of the blue flames, uh, ah, I've yes. got some questions. Um, okay. it, you're working on the audiobook for that currently. Do you know if there's a release date available yet? The audiobook or... is finished. Oh, it's finished. It's I'm so excited. <laughs> Jacqueline Hagen has it. I made some mistakes. Uh, so we, we have a pickup session at the end of every um, audiobook. Um, okay. So I may I may flub a word or I may um, mm. the, the syntax might change because what happens is we read we read one line ahead. So mm. when I'm speaking, I'm looking at the next line. So I'm kind of memorizing that line if if you like. And sometimes the word order gets changed. Um, but I think I have about maybe 10 or 12 mistakes that I need to, to fix mm -hmm. um, tomorrow. 
Um, <laughs> and that's not bad over a 24 hour book. I'm getting I was going to say. Yeah. <laughs> um some of them some of them you just ignore as well if they don't if they don't affect the flow of the book um something that Jacqueline's quite aware of is um knowing what to leave alone and knowing something that really needs to change because it, it right. sounds wrong it will be out sometime in the next week or oh. two yes that's right There's so I'll, I'll, I'll finish the pickups tomorrow Jacqueline I promise <laughs> um and uh and then it takes yeah it takes about 10 business days I think to, to get it all uploaded and out so it'll definitely be out before Christmas that's for sure that is very exciting. I know what I'm doing on Christmas. <laughs> so I, I'm really curious. Um, mm. Who has been your favorite character to narrate for in this series? Chester. Chester. Oh, mm. interesting. Yes, it is. I, I have I have favorite characters um, throughout the book. I mean, I, I love Ink, mm. um, and, and and all of the characters are just they're just so amazingly um, real. Yes, um, you know, Jacqueline's done so well with with how she's written them. Chester, for me, is just a is just a is the square peg trying to get into the round hole. Mm. Um, whether it's through humor, um, or being bawdy, um, or, or dealing with his, um, his his massive desire and love for wine. Yes, um, <laughs> but he reminds me so much. I, I've told you earlier that I used to work um, at the Abbey Theatre, and he reminds me so much of. Um, kind of middle-aged um flamboyant actors um <laughs> after the show who are absolutely wonderful to be around um they're the life and soul of the party they're constantly bringing people up you know mm -hmm. from from a mood level if you're up or down or you know and, and i just i i just enjoy doing chester um i was furious uh no i can't say that can i because i'd be giving a spoiler for book two um, yeah but, no but don't worry uh, everything's fine chester's okay you um, you were furious I, about I, a development I'm, I'm happy i was furious about a development but um i, I was <laughs> i was uh, i was furious too early let's put it that way okay so, um he was fine yes uh sorry jackie i don't know what i'm supposed to say here and what i'm not supposed to say <laughs> i don't want to okay. i don't want to spoil this story um but yes brilliant three brilliant books um, and I have thoroughly enjoyed doing them. And this one's been been absolutely fantastic. A long one this time. So it's 24 yes. hours long. Um, but it was great. Oh, I'm I'm so looking forward to it. I've um mm. I bought the so after I finished the spider key, I actually did reaction videos to the endings of both Wickwire and uh, the spider key because how could you not with those endings? I know, she's terrible. And then after the ending of the spider key, I was so afraid to continue. <laughs> and Jackie, she reassured me it's all going to be fine. Um, but then I, was, I heard the audiobook was coming out and I, I was just mm. like, I'll wait. I'm going to oh. wait for that audiobook. Um, so I'm so excited to continue and hopefully everything be fine because my dear, my heart. Uh, yes. <laughs> but um, uh, on the flip side of things, I would love to know who was the most challenging for you to narrate? Um, from a vocal perspective, the specters are quite, mm. um, are quite vocally intense, but from a character perspective, Martin, um, oh, okay. Martin's a very troubled soul. Mm. Um, and you have, you have to make him believable. Um, that level of, of sorrow and anger, um, and insecurity and, and it's just overall f mental fatigue from mm. from what he goes through um but as i said it, it's it's it was it was very hard to not overplay martin so right you've, and you've got to be very careful with that as i said again the suspension of disbelief um he has to cope in in, in a world where where no one else possibly apart from caradoc um has to deal with li literally deal with those demons um, yeah within him um and yeah he's he's been quite um in in this book particularly in in book three um he, it was a very very difficult um a very very difficult read um as i said to maintain that balance and to bring out um to bring out the good and the bad in him um particularly the insecurities of it um and that of that overall helplessness from time to time um but as I said, yeah, he's um, he's quite an emotional he's quite an emotional roller coaster for me as well. 
and they, they, they do affect me uh, you know in the booth there are times when I have to stop um, and um, kind of take a break uh, just to kind of reset vocally particularly and, and emotionally because you're running from you know from one emotion into the next but as far as challenges go yeah it's got to be Martin for sure and he's he's one of my favorite characters as I said I chose I chose Chester on the prelim thank you yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I've, I've had a look through your questions before, as I said, but um, yeah, and I chose Chester as an overall, um, but, but Martin is one of my favorite characters in it as well. I stay with us. Oh, yes. No, I, I completely agree with uh, Jackie here. Martin's performance is just uh, amazing how you do that. Um, and, and I can appreciate the differences too, because Chester is the life of the party, whereas Martin is, yeah. is struggling. Um, mm. so it's, I, I can see where the challenge would be, but, uh, absolutely his, his character is really well done. Um, so we have a question from Esme, uh, from mm. Twitter. And, uh, so she would like to know, is there a certain book that you would love to narrate or an author that you wish you could work with? Yes. Um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy by John <laughs> Le Carre, who has since passed away. Um, but yeah. if they came to me and asked me to do every single book he's ever written, I would probably do it for free. Oh, that's um, amazing. It's, um, as I said, I love that whole kind of gas lamp fiction. Mm. Um, now, Tinker Tailor, you move that into the 60s and 70s, um, into old British establishment espionage. And that's just heaven on earth for me. So, yeah, for sure. <laughs> if anyone is listening, I'm your guy. There you go. You heard it here. <laughs> and uh, she'd also like to know when you are reading for just pleasure, um, do you make an entire performance of it in your mind? Yes, I do. And I've done that since I was a kid. Um, I think I think a lot of people do that, um, mm. but a lot less than I thought. Um, I have spoken to other people and I go, when you when you read... Um, do you have different voices in your head? And they go, no. And I'm mm. like, how do you understand what's going on? You know, how do you, <laughs> that's, it's, it's horses for yeah. horses. Yeah. Um, yes, there's an entire production uh, in my head when I read for sure. And um, when I do anything, in fact, um, okay. it doesn't have to be just reading, driving, walking around, shopping. Everything has a kind of narrative to it. <laughs> I love like. it. Yeah. Um, that can, that can, little companion narrative. <laughs> Um, so actually I, I need to bring this up because I can't agree with you more, Tori. Jackie says, uh, or she says, it's all going to be fine, says Jackie with an evil smirk. Yeah, I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> no. God and it's gonna happen. Absolutely appropriate, Jackie, with the the evil grin there. Indeed. Um, so you've also narrated Wistful Ascending by JCM yes. Byrne. Mm. What was it like narrating a superhero character? Because you talked about the the physical motions that you will need to do sometimes. I'm really curious how that differs from the Victorian gas lamp and other genres. I, when I when I saw the cover um, of that book, I told you I I just I was straight to it. Um, a lot of people say don't judge a book by its cover. I mean, you, mm. everybody knows this phrase, um, but I have to say that I've I've probably done better as a narrator by 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 judging books by their cover immediately um the right our covers are incredible um mm -hmm. and and wistful ascending was is, is an absolutely marvelous cover um so that was the first thing that drew me to it um rohan's not your um he's, he's not your average superhero mm -hmm. um there's a there's a calmness to him and, and, and a humanism to him i think um that makes him very easy to narrate um, the fight scenes in that book are are very intense. Yes, um, but they're written they're written in a in a descriptive. Now he'll correct me if I'm wrong on this because he's the author. I, ju I just I just bark away at the, in, <laughs> in the microphone. But um, he's written them in such a way as as you're you're kind of, you kind of have a, a satellite view um, of the action that's going on, uh, and there's not a lot of dialogue in those fights. So it's more of a, of a description of what's happening around mm. those characters. Yes. Um, they're very intense. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of punching and there's a lot of um, mini kicks um, that I call them. I, I tend to kick with my hands and not with my um, 
I swear to God, if I, sh I should film this at some point, I must look insane <laughs> uh, when I'm doing these things. But obviously, I can't kick out under the desk because something's going to happen. Yes. But, um, I, I do move my hands around a lot. There's a lot of grunting and gasping. And you've got to put that you've got to put that movement in into what you're saying. Um, right. And something else I learned over the years um, from from some really, really good narrators is the faster the action in the scene, the slower your vocal should be. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. So if, if, if there's a lot of fighting going on um, or there's explosions or there's shooting or you bring it back hmm. and, and slow it down. And that basically you're, you're painting a very, very dramatic, very high speed, very dynamic picture for the listener. But you've got to give them time to see that in their heads. Yes. So you've got to slow down, slow down the vocal to paint the picture like that. Um, and all of his action scenes are so beautifully written and it's, it's very, very easy to, to narrate that. Um, right. But playing a superhero, sure. Everybody wants to play a superhero <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, and he's um, he's quirky, you know, right, right down to mm. the um, to the yellow and purple jumpsuit. You yes. Know, he's, the, he's a reluctant superhero, I think, uh, at the Absolutely. best of times. Um, and that comes across a lot in his in his sarcasm and the kind of offhandishness that he tends to throw at, you know, these incredible things that he can do. You know, you're moving starships around with your hands. Marvelous. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, that's uh, that's his retirement. <laughs> I, I, it is for sure. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, apparently, book two is coming soon, but uh, we're, we're trying to oh, hammer nice. that out at the moment uh, from a scheduling point of view. But I'm looking forward to it. That's exciting. Not, not that I'm announcing the audiobook or anything, but uh, <laughs> we'll <get there. laughs> yeah, no, that's good. And um, talking about developing the non-human voices, mm. uh, you we talked a little bit about the Irish voice that some of the villains got, but I'm, I'm curious mm. for the space bears, what was the, the development bears. of their voice like? The, the idea for the space bears accent um, came from Joseph himself. Uh, he came to me and I, I told you about various looking for various character notes. And he had said, at least I think he'd said, I've got to go back through the emails. Um, but I think he said that he had heard them um, in his head as being Russian. Would that be correct? Is he here? Or is he gone? He's probably gone. Um, he might still he be had, here, um, but he we'll see. <laughs> okay. um, but he had basically said to me, they sound Russian uh, in my head. And I was like, OK, well, we can we can work with that um, as a basic accent. Um, and then to kind of develop them as a character, um, I did a little bit of research just, you know, you watch a few kind of bear documentaries, you're looking at mannerisms for bears. Um, and they're quite human in, in, in how they interact. I mean, a lot of them are solitary creatures, mm -hmm. um, which is which is a strange kind of element. So but what we have here is an entire um, starship full of bears, um, yes. which in, in reality would not be the case, because as I said, bears are solitary. So I moved it. Um, I slid. I combined. Um, apes with bears i don't know if you've ever seen an old science science fiction movie called planet of the apes or a tv series yes, yeah. yes. well i mean a little so, thing yes and then if you look <laughs> at them and you look at their personalities they've got w within the world that the, the world building that's done within within that tv show you've got doctors nurses mothers fathers bakers everyone's basically mm. doing what they do so i thought well if i can if i can take that structure change the apes into bears give them Russian accents um, with Ursula being the main kind of maternal and nurturing character throughout the whole lot. Um, then I can then I can build it all up from there. Very and nice. That's what, that's what I did with with the um, with the bears. Yes. Oh, I love it. Mm. But it, it's mostly Ursula. I mean, she's OK. She she does. She has she's the most um, the most present character in the whole book anyway. But I like her. She's fun. She is. Yes. Mm. I, I, I loved her um, initial interactions with Rohan. Yeah. <laughs> Always fun. Plant um, yeah. <laughs> so so similar questions to the, the Wickware Watch and the Riverfall Chronicles. Mm. Was there a favorite character, a more challenging character within Wistful? Wei Li. OK. Um, yeah, she's she's um, chief security officer, but um, has a soft spot for Rohan. Mm. Um, but is deadly serious about her her work yes. <laughs> um, and the so the humor never really gets tactile I had mm. I had always thought of the when I was reading through the book that there might have been a romantic interest between Rohan and Whaley 
And by the time you get to the end of book one, I haven't I haven't gone near book two or book three. Uh, that's definitely not there. Yeah. Um, so I um, she she was kind of the challenge, as I said, to be able to be um, um, to be kind of to be friendly towards him, but to be his not so much his boss, um, but, but to lead him at the same time out of his because um, he's a superhero. He's essentially indestructible. She's mm. not. And his his security and risk assessment is coming from a character who is indestructible. Um, yes. So there, are, her job is to make sure that he remembers that the people around him are not. Um, while at the same time, you know, um, as I said, keeping it as lighthearted as possible um, and to try and deliver that w with all of the sarcasm uh, that, that she has as well in, uh, you know, as she speaks. Yes. So, yeah, she was a fun character to work on, but she a lot of thought. It doesn't probably doesn't really sound like it, but a lot of thought went into the type of person she was or how she would sound anyway. I, I can imagine that because you, you mentioned her sarcasm. And for me, I found this while listening and reading was that um, her sarcasm sounds like you, you can tell she's being sarcastic. But at the same time, if you didn't know her well enough, you'd have no idea she was being sarcastic. That yeah, kind of very dry dynamic. Yes. So mm. it's um, oh, there we go with Joe. Yes, Ersons are supposed to have Ersons. a bad Russian accent. They have very bad Russian accent. They have John Malkovich Russian accents. Well. <laughs> yes. You're welcome. There. <laughs> Love it. And um, so I, I'm, I'm just going to put it out to the chat really quick. If you all have questions sure. as well, throw them in there um, and we'll we'll get into those. Um, but we have a, a few more to go through here if, if you still wow. have time. Yeah, I'm fine. Go yeah, for it. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so you've we, we've talked about this through a little bit with Martin, but you've mm. done really well with emotionally impactful moments and, and hitting that in your narration. Thank you. Is this something you? Yeah. Um, is this something that comes through uh, naturally when you're reading? Do you have to prep for this um, and be mindful of it while you're recording? I I prep for it. Um, so I know that it's coming. Um, and then when I get into the flow of the narration, um, it tends to take on a life of its own. Mm. Um, and as I said, I've, I, I allow it to run emotionally, but I, I obviously make sure I don't overplay it. Mm. Um, and the older I get, the more life experience I have, you know, um, we've all been hurt. We've all been sad. We've all lost a loved one. We've all been cheated on. We've all been angry. Um, not many of us have have been in deep space pushing starships around. But, <laughs> you know, there's so, but 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 then again, no matter where you are, those those emotions are there. Um, you'll get angry mm. in deep space as a human just as quickly as you will, you know, on Earth. Um, mm. and I think that the older you get, um, the the more experiences you have in that bag. Um, I wouldn't say it was kind of Stanislavski kind of elements up to it, but it's it's more of a life experience element of it. I can try to kind of go back it's not it's not that I purposefully go back and think about a time when I was sad or whatever mm. but if it, once the book is written well enough it will automatically trigger that empathy anyway so right. you know it will remind you of something um or something will fire off and you'll try and you've got to run with that emotion but but at the same time is this paradox of keeping it under control as well right uh, so that it you know you just don't get too out of hand but mm. um yeah so it most of the time it comes naturally Hopefully. yeah it's um i i certainly appreciate what you just said there was the uh you want it to be there but not over the top yeah you want the reader to be immersed but you don't want them to be um put out of the experience that's such a fine line to balance i yeah. imagine that's something you're constantly checking on yeah while you're recording I do. And um, and authors are very good as well. I mean, authors are very helpful in, in picking up stuff like that. Um, they tend not to, authors tend not to micromanage. Um, but I have found that if I'm really out of the way or I've missed the point, uh, you know, an author will come back and say something. But I don't think I've had that happen yet, but I, I would hope that they would anyway. <laughs> well, and that and I imagine that would help you grow as well. Right. Indeed. And, and add to that experience bucket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, 
So we, we've we've talked about a lot of things, and mm. I would love to know from uh, every aspect, every facet of the narrating process, your career, um, what has been the best trick that you've picked up that still helps you to this day? I've probably spoke about that already. Um, I, I would if say, if I it's would say different. Slow, I would say slowing down um, mm. rather than speeding up. I, I think that's really important. Um, what other tricks have I learned? God, there's so there's so many. Of them. <laughs> uh, I should have actually looked at. Why did I miss that? Um, no, that's okay. If put down here with this, yeah. Um, no, there's, there's there's just lots of small little things that come up. As mm. I said, um, the, the one of the big ones for me that changed how I, I narrated was being told by by reviewers um, that a conversational tone was much better. And I think right. that has. And I mean, I'm, I'm talking about getting that critique maybe twelve years ago. Mm. Um, but to this day, um, I'm, I'm always aware of, am, am I getting too truncated with this? Um, am I, am I too tight? Is, is this not flowing? Um, mm. and I, I think that that's absolutely vital. A lot of people miss that. Um, and the other thing as well, I suppose, is don't, don't try and emulate any other narrator vocally. I, oh, okay. I get a lot of people. Um, a lot of new narrators who are, are, are beginning to start their work um, will try to sound like other narrators uh, until you mm. develop an ear for it. And then you suddenly realize that all the narrators, all the narrators that I thought sounded the same don't. Um, right. They've all got individual variations in their voice where, you know, you can you can pick it up now immediately. Um, some some narrators have beautiful um beautiful layers you know kevin kemp's a brilliant narrator yes um, you can do anything yeah. you know it's just like and it's it's enviable you know you've got like you know high range low range mid range anything in between any acting you know is brilliant but I, i've got i've got my voice um i know what it is mm. um and, and one of those tricks as i said as well is is just being confident enough to know that it's not it's not really down to your voice it's down to your ability to tell a story mm. and and to never lose sight of that it's just no matter how you sound um if if you have the ability to suspend disbelief for someone and do that for hour upon hour upon hour um i think you've done really well as a narrator that's brilliant that that's beautiful mm. um i i can see where that would be so important to so many um where you know we see all these voice actors who are able to do 15 different vo character voices you'd never know it's the same person um, mm. but you don't necessarily have to be able to do that to be successful at what you do so that's that's amazing Indeed. and uh last call for live chat if you'd like to throw those questions in there by all means definitely do we're on our last we're question now 15. here my goodness me Okay. I had time flies, That's doesn't our last it? Question. <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> I'm ready. Go for it. So, if an author wanted to have you narrate their book, mm. how would they go about reaching out to you about getting that done? Um, I have a website, WayneFarrell.net. Uh, you can contact me through that. Um, I'm on Twitter, the Wayne Farrell. I'm on Instagram, Wayne Farrell Voiceovers. Um, I, I'm everywhere. You'll find, you'll find, if you want me bad <laughs> enough, you'll find me. Um, and, uh, I'd be more than willing to have a chat with you about, uh, about bringing your book to life in audio. Brilliant. And um, the links are all in the description below too. Um, so if Wonderful. they want to find it there, they can. Um, is there anything that they should include in that initial reach out or just say, hi, no, I'm interested. Just, just say hi. And then we'll have a chat about your book and, um, We'll find out if 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 I'm if I'm a good match for that. I, I think that's something else mm. that you need to be quite brave about, as a narrator is is um, having the ability to give a manuscript back. Um, not so much if it doesn't match. Um, if it, well, if it doesn't match you, if if, if it's not something that you gel with, um, but particularly from the off for the author's perspective as well, you mm. want their audio book to be a success. You you know you you want the industry to grow. And if, if it looks like it's something that somebody else can do, I, I have given manuscripts back in the past, uh, along with a list of other narrators uh, oh, wow. who I think would possibly do a better job on it. Um, and, you know, so, yeah, as I said, initially, um, if, you, if you want me to do an audiobook for you, we'll have we'll have a chat about it, first of all. 
um, have a look at your book and uh, see if it works. And if it works, then there you go. We'll, we'll be on Audible. There you go. <laughs> I love it. If the Quality, Irish isn't not. in me. <laughs> well, There you I, go. I, I appreciate the um, quality, not quantity. Mm. Yeah, I indeed. think that's so important. So Mm. thank you so much, Wayne, for, for joining me and Thank you chatting for having about me. everything. It was uh, phenomenal <laughs> to hear all your answers. it's been fun. I, I can't believe we got an hour and 15 minutes out of that. But uh, there you go. I, I, I do talk a lot, though. No, it, it's great. It's, um, it's, it's fascinating to hear as a reader. Indeed. I always <laughs> love to hear behind the scenes, same with authors. How did you come up with this, right? Everyone's story Yeah. is unique and their experiences are different. So thank you so much for sharing that with us. And uh, absolutely, everyone in the chat too, thank you so Yeah, much for thank watching. you. Amazing to see everyone here. <laughs> Appreciate it. and uh, as always, everyone, thank you for watching and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.